Welcome to uh, New Life. Uh, my name is Paul McFadden. I'm one of the deacons here. I've been asked to uh, offer the welcome today uh, with a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, there's uh, an online uh, prayer meeting today at 3 o'clock. So please uh, join 120 of your closest friends and, and uh, fellow members at, uh, at New Life and, and uh, uh, participate in that. The other item is the relief. Uh, uh, a brief update on what we're doing as deacons and also uh, members of the church, um, doing a, a number of things. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for your continued giving. Uh, we're, we're very, very blessed uh, with the giving to the diaconate, to the Mercy Fund, so thank you for that. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we've set up a couple of teams to go out and help uh, individuals that need food or need uh, groceries or medical supplies. We've helped uh, over two dozen individuals and families with that uh, over the last couple of months. We've even had uh, a request for some uh, masks. Uh, so the, the word went out, uh, we had 10 uh, individuals sewing masks, uh, had another uh, uh, person that went out and purchased the material, donated it. We, we've uh, put together over 80 masks uh, and do distributed those, most of them, vast majority of them to uh, members of the church. So thank you for that. Um, the last uh, uh, thing I wanted to mention is we've had a number of folks uh, re uh, call and request uh, uh, help. And I think one of the, uh, the most uh, touching uh, stories for me is a woman who had a, uh, a, a problem with a, a leaky uh, toilet, uh, was uh, water all over the floor, whose husband is in the United States Marine Corps, deployed overseas, made a call to the church office, uh, the email went out to the HELPS team. Within eight minutes, uh, someone had volunteered to go and fix not only that toilet, but saw a problem with a second toilet, fixed that, repaired a safety lock on the door to help uh, uh, with the kids and keeping the family safe while her husband was deployed, and then fixed a broken window. Two minutes after that fellow responded, we had three more people respond that they would be willing to do that as well. So. It's been a huge blessing to be a part of that and uh, just thought you, we'd like to share some of those things that were happening kind of uh, behind the scenes. So thank you. Good morning, New Life. I remember the first job I got out of college, my first real grown up job, um, it was in corporate America. And I remember about a month into my job, I was so stressed and under so much anxiety that I broke out into something that mirrored a really bad case of the hives or the measles. Um, it, I had itchy, rashy things all over my body. My entire face looked like I was swarmed by mosquitoes, totally swollen eyes and lips and ears. And the reason why I share that is because I had so much inner um, angst and pressure that it actually manifested physically. It wasn't because of some sort of an illness or a virus. I couldn't take a pill just to get to resolve this issue. Um, it had to really get to the ways that I was thinking. And as I was thinking about how do I get past this? How do I live through this? And how do I get back to work? That was a real issue for me. For some of you that are watching, that are listening in right now, you may be going through something that's causing a similar kind of an inner angst. It could be as a result of the pandemic, and some of you are experiencing real trauma and real hardship because of it. Some of you may be something that has been going on for a long time. It's your marriage, and it's, you just can't take a pill to just get it fixed. And you ask yourself, how do I get through this? How am I to live? How am I to live through something like this? Well, if that's where you are, welcome to New Life. We're really glad that you're able to participate in this service. Um, we're not going to solve that problem entirely, but during the course of this worship, we're hoping that um, you'll be able to address that question, that question of how do I live, and that you will be encouraged and your heart will be stirred to look to Jesus, to look to the gospel, to figure out how to live through all of the different issues and conflicts that you might be going through. So for this morning's call to worship, I'm going to be reading from Psalm 46. So if you're able, would you stand with me? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can gather together virtually as your people. We pray that as we enter into your presence, that we would know that we come into the hands and into the arms of a loving and gracious and comforting Father. Wherever we may be, whatever state of mind that we might be in, whatever the angst or trauma that we may be dealing with within in our hearts, I pray, God, that you would minister, you would comfort, you would encourage, and you would build up our faith, and you would build up this church. We ask that Jesus, your name would be lifted high. In your name we pray, amen. is risen 
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come to you grateful for all that you've done for us in Christ Jesus. And yet at the same time, we are aware of our constant need of your grace. We confess that we have sinned, sinned against strangers and neighbors, sinned against friends and family, but most of all, we've sinned against you. We've broken your commandments. We have failed to love you. We have fallen short of your glory, and every day we fall short of your glory. Your word warns us that anyone who stumbles at just one point in the law is guilty of breaking the whole law. O Lord, our God, holy and just, we are guilty. We are filthy. Please, O Lord, have mercy on us, and not for our own sake, but for Jesus' sake. Wash us clean in his blood. Forgive us our wickedness because of his righteousness. And even as we pray these words, we give thanks to you. We give thanks because we know that you are faithful to forgive. Thank you that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become righteous before you. And as our old selves pass away, may our new selves imitate Christ and bear the fruit of his spirit. And now, Father, as your children, we bring to you our needs. Jesus commanded us to ask, to seek, to knock. And so we come before you and we ask. We ask for wise government leaders. In these difficult times, in these disorienting situations, please give wisdom and understanding to all of our government officials, from President Trump to the local police officer just down the road. May they act justly and discern rightly between good and evil. We ask also for your blessing to be with your church. Make us holy, even as you are holy. May our whole manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And may we shine as lights in the midst of a dark world as we hold fast to your word of life. May we be used by you for your own glory and praise. And finally, gracious Father, we pray for the afflicted among us. Some of us are sick. Please heal us. Some of us are weeping, please comfort us. Some of us are overwhelmed and exhausted, please give us some rest. Some of us are depressed, finding that the most miserable miserable person to be with is ourselves. Help us to look to Christ and give us the joy of his spirit. Some of us are anxious, even terrified for what the future might hold, please give us the peace that comes from your spirit and goes beyond our own understanding. Father, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. So we come in the name of Jesus, our savior. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for his sake, amen. And now as we continue to worship, please join us in a song of living hope. The mountains I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven I spoke your name into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Who could imagine 
imagine so great a mercy when I could fathom such boundless is spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living Lord Hallelujah praise the Set me free, hallelujah. Death and lost his grip on me. You and broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. series in the book of Habakkuk. And uh, just to recap before we go to our reading, right, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, is uh, in serious spiritual and moral cultural decline. The prophet Habakkuk, um, it, it, he doesn't, it doesn't look to him like God's, God is uh, doing anything. Uh, so he prays to God, where are you, God? Right? Judge the evil in, in our land. Restore our, our country. And God answers him, but he answers him in a surprising way. God, God says, I, I'm, I'm going to do something, uh, and, and it's something that's so amazing that you won't even believe it if I tell you. Uh, I'm going to raise up the Babylonian Empire, says God, to crush Judah, to send its citizens into exile, uh, to essentially end life in Judah as, as uh, Habakkuk knew it. And that raised a dilemma, immediately raised a problem for Habakkuk. It, you know, how could a good God, a just God, raise up an even more evil nation 
and use that more evil nation, pagan nation, uh, to judge God's own chosen people. And near the end of chapter one, that's, that's the question that uh, Habakkuk is raising with God. And we're sort of left at the end of chapter one, that, that question is sort of hanging in the air. And now we come to chapter two, and this is the beginning of God's answer. It's not the whole answer. The, the, that'll wait till next week. But this is, this is sort of an interlude where God is setting up uh, his answer. We're going to be looking at Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. This is the reading of God's word. Uh, you may be seated. Let's pray. Father, uh, build us up today and humble us by your word as we, your people, by faith, follow Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many of you uh, will remember the Columbia shuttle disaster in 2003. Some of you uh, probably weren't born then, but uh, you've read it in the history books. The Columbia uh, shuttle disaster was the one where the, the Columbia launched successfully, uh, it orbited successfully, it accomplished its mission successfully, and then upon re-entry, uh, it, it broke up and uh, um, the, the whole entire crew was killed. Uh, it was ultimately determined that the, uh, the Columbia was a victim of a defect in the um, foam insulation around the exterior fuel tank, that big brown fuel tank on the shuttle. So in the best the proudest, the sexiest space program in the world, there was a defect that would doom it. It had been there all along. The deceiving thing about that defect is that even though it was, it was there, it couldn't be seen, and it didn't prevent a lot of success. I mean, the shuttle program was considered a, a great success, and yet, from the very beginning, it contained within itself the seed of its own destruction. So why am I talking uh, about the Columbia Space Shuttle? Because I think it's a metaphor for the human experience. Like the Columbia Shuttle, every human being, man, woman, boy, girl, has an invisible internal defect. The Bible calls it sin. Sin is hidden, it's, and it's an internal reality, uh, but the fact that it's there doesn't necessarily mean that your life, w w that you won't have um, uh, success or achievement or happiness. Uh, you, you can have those things, but the fact that sin is there dooms you to eventual destruction. It is an inevitable, disintegrating reality. If you look at verse 4 here, Habakkuk says that um, there are really just two ways to live. Right? There are two kinds of people. You can be self-reliant or you can be God-reliant. It's the way of having faith in yourself versus having faith in God. The Bible calls people that choose the way of self-reliance uh, proud, uh, arrogant, puffed up, 
Puffed up is the word used here. By the way, this is a reference to the Babylonians. What, what, what God is doing is, is speaking of, of the empire as if it was a single person. Right? He, he, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright uh, within him. Uh, it's interesting to note that that word puffed up, which denotes pride or arrogance, uh, also in Hebrew refers to cancerous tumors. So, so there's a suggestion that, that, that this kind of life, this kind of pride that builds a life uh, without reference to God is, is, is deadly. It's, it's cancerous. If you're self-reliant, you haven't dealt with your deadly, invisible, internal flaw. As I said, you can live with it a while. Uh, you, you may, for a while, be powerful and sexy and popular and good-looking, and, uh, but at some point, there's re-entry. It's, and at re-entry, you will begin to break up. You'll begin to disintegrate. Sin is a dis disintegrating reality. It's, it, you're going to, with sin, crash and burn. The only way to avoid it, the only way to avoid that fate is to take what the Bible calls the ancient path, which is the path of faith, to be a God-reliant person, to go outside of yourself for inner, inner transformation uh, and for the resources you need to live. You know, Habakkuk 2.4 is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. That last phrase, the righteous, the righteous shall live by his faith. Uh, that was picked up by Paul uh, in, in both in Romans, his book uh, Romans and in his book of the Galatians to the Galatians, where he is explaining justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And, and he quotes Habakkuk here. The righteous shall live by his faith. Right? We're justified uh, not by our own good works, but by trusting in the good works of another, of course, Jesus Christ. Uh, the writer of Hebrews picked up uh, Habakkuk 2.4 uh, for the same uh, thing. It, it, Habakkuk 2.4, so in a way you could say that Habakkuk, is the, is the Old Testament uh, trigger for the Protestant Reformation because it was the rediscovery of, of this truth that, that Christianity is not a, a religion of, of working your way up to God, but it is a matter of trusting the God who came down to you and worked up for you to do what you can't do. That's what the Reformation rediscovered, and they found it right here uh, in Habakkuk. It is the essence of the good, new, good news uh, of Jesus. Right? And when you do that, when you trust uh, in, by, by faith, you're trusting in Jesus, uh, that deadly defect in your soul is healed. It's transformed. It's actually traded out. Right? It's, it's, you exchange your sin, and Jesus takes it, and in exchange, he gives you his perfect righteousness by faith. And so you stand by faith, forgiven and declared righteous for all time. That's justification by faith. That's the center of our faith. But, but Christianity isn't just a one-time thing, right? It's not you, you make a decision one time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're therefore justified and boom, you can, you, you can go on with your life. No, it's the, the righteous shall live by his faith. What, did it, what does it mean to live by our faith? Well, I think here's where Habakkuk can really help because uh, Habakkuk does a, an interesting thing here because it, he, he, he shows us that 
a big part of living by faith is what the Bible calls waiting upon the Lord. That's what Habakkuk is doing here. He's, God calls him to, here to, to, to both watch and wait. And it is in the waiting of Habakkuk right here that we learn five facts about what it is to wait upon the Lord. If you're a Christian, you're called to wait upon the Lord, which is another way of saying living by your faith. What are these five facts? Let's unpack these five facts. I hope they'll be helpful and encouraging to you. Um, in each statement of the fact, I've got an O word, a word that begins with O, kind of the key word, if it helps you understand, uh, helps you remember. First, waiting on the Lord is like an optical illusion. It looks and feels like waiting, but it really isn't waiting in the sense that we usually think of waiting, right? Waiting for us, not always, but usually implies some kind of breakdown, something being out of control, something being late, something being too slow, right? But God, God says here in verse 3 that uh, these events in the future that he's going to be telling Habakkuk about are, are not delaying, they're, they're hastening on, uh, and uh, they will arrive at the appointed time. I love that phrase. The vision awaits its appointed time. And God's in control of the appointment book. God's in control of your appointment book. As we sit here today and contemplate our futures, you need to remember that every event, every event, major or minuscule, has an appointed time. And God brings it right at the appointed time. Paul Tripp, the Christian counselor, writes, waiting is not a sign that your world is out of control. Rather, it's a sign that your world is under the wise and infinitely attentive control of a God of fathomless wisdom and boundless love. This means you can rest as you wait, not because you like to wait, but because you trust the one who's calling you to wait. Good and true words. So the first fact about waiting on the Lord, it's, it's like an optical illusion. It looks like waiting for something that's late, and, but it isn't. Okay? Second thing about waiting on the Lord is that it is a, acquiring an overview I'm sure it's true for you, it's true for me. When I'm undergoing some kind of trial, uh, facing some kind of problem, uh, I tend to get tunnel vision, right? The problem, the trial, the whatever, whatever it is that, that is uh, uh, disquieting me lit literally takes up my whole vision. It's like my world shrinks and real, all I see is the problem. That's a, that's a big reason why a lot of us are frustrated and fearful, sometimes angry uh, in, in times like this, because, you know, here, here we are in this uh, coronavirus pandemic, and it's very easy to get tunnel vision and, to ju and just to focus on, on, on the problem. Habakkuk does something very interesting here in verse 1. It says that he, uh, he stations himself in a tower. Verse 1, station, I will station myself on the tower. Now, why, do you, why, why would Habakkuk go into a tower? Why does anyone go into a tower, right? It's to get an overview. It's to expand your vision. It's to see uh, the lay of the land. It's to understand the 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 big picture. 
to understand what's happening around you. And you can only see that from the vantage point of, of the tower. So should we build towers? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what does that mean for you and for me? Well, what, what's our tower? What, what is it that gives you and me our overview? What gives us the, a God's eye view of reality? What is it that allows us to see the big picture and to understand uh, what, what's going on around us? The answer is scripture, right? You don't climb into a tower, you climb into the book. Right. This book is what gives us uh, the, the overview, God's eye view of your life and your challenges and what do you learn, what do you see? Well, you see what we saw last week, that your present sufferings, no matter how deep, and boy, I, this, just this last week, I have, I have been dealing with several families here at New Life that are deal, de really dealing with s the most serious kind of suffering. Just suffering that just undoes you. But what do we learn? That our present sufferings, even those kinds of suffering, aren't worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us when when the Lord returns, Romans 8.18. You see that God is working all things together for the good of those uh, who love him and are called according to his purpose. You see that nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, uh, our Lord. See, waiting on the Lord is acquiring an overview, and you get that from the book. Third, waiting on the Lord is laying down on God's operating table. We may not like it, but the fact is God uses our suffering to grow us and mature us. Right? Romans 5 3 through 5 is a, is a good example of that kind of teaching that's all through the Bible, right? We rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. When we're suffering, when we're in difficult times, times that we would never choose for ourselves, there is transformative grace going on. One of the ways C.S. Lewis used to describe that is, you know, it's a severe mercy. Trials are a transformative grace. It, it's God coming in his mercy and in his grace and using our suffering to transform us, to change us, to make us stronger, better people. Listen to uh, Paul Tripp again. I'm, uh, this is a, uh, an article he, he, had, he wrote several years ago on, um, on waiting, uh, waiting on the Lord. He says, waiting is not only about what you will receive at the end of the wait, Waiting is about what you will become as you wait. In calling us to wait, God is rescuing us from our bondage to our own plan, our own wisdom, our own power, our own control. In calling us to wait, God is freeing us from the claustrophobic confines of our own little kingdoms of one and drawing us into a greater allegiance to the kingdom of to his kingdom of glory and grace waiting is more than being patient as situations and other people change waiting is about understanding that you and I desperately need to change and that waiting is a powerful tool of personal change 
Waiting on the Lord is laying out on God's operating table. Fourth, waiting upon the Lord means owning your own limitations. Faith in Jesus Christ produces many things in our lives, but if it isn't producing humility, you have to question the faith. Being reliant on Jesus generates humility. God tells Habakkuk to watch and to wait for, his, for, for God's answer because Habakkuk doesn't know what God is going to do tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. Proverbs 27.1, which James picks up in his in his letter, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Christian friends, one of the surest ways to be anxious and afraid in troubled times is to think you know what's going to happen and you know what to do about it. Actually, you don't. And the sooner you realize it, and place omniscience where it belongs, which is with God, the sooner you will be relieved, the sooner you'll be encouraged, the sooner you will know the freedom of resting in an omniscient God who knows what's happening tomorrow. That's not to say that we don't plan. It's not to say that we don't think about the future and and plan accordingly. It is to, to plan humbly and to execute our plans humbly. Because we don't know what the future holds. And God may show us a different way, a different plan. So we have to, we plan humbly. So waiting upon the Lord means owning your limitations. And finally, fifth, waiting upon the Lord involves obedience. In verse 1, Habakkuk uses a military metaphor, right? He says, I will take my stand at my watch post. That's military language. There's a temptation, I know, and some of you may be feeling it as as Christians. when, when, When life is is falling apart when you don't see light at the end of the tunnel, when you've lost vis- your visible means of, of earthly support. All these things, of course, are, are happening during this pandemic. It's, there's a temptation to call it quits. There's a temptation to throw in the towel on Jesus, right? It's, it is, you know, I've, tr- I've tried this Christianity thing and it didn't work for me. Listen, we've got a lot of military personnel at New Life. It's one of the, one of the great advantages of being a church you know, near a couple of military bases. Military people know that, uh, that you don't have the option to throw in the towel or to call it quits. It doesn't matter whether you think uh, what you're doing, what you've been ordered to do is, is fun or boring or whether you, or not you think it makes any difference. The fact is you have to stay at your post. You have to be awake at your post. You have to, you have to follow your orders. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The risen Jesus says in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, he says to believers who were facing targeted persecution, right? A government dedicated to wiping out this this fledgling uh, movement. Uh, Jesus says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life.
The essence of waiting on the Lord is, is persevering faith. Right? Saving faith is persevering faith. And the obedience that we're called to is that obedience of faith, that obedience to keep on believing, to keep on trusting, even through the evil days, even through the discouragement, even through the events that you don't understand. In his uh, wonderful book, The Screwtape Letters, uh, C.S. Lewis, the Screwtape is, you know, ch chief demon. And he's educating this uh, underling uh, on, uh, on how to interfere with Christian's prayer life. And Screwtape says this, and it's true. The, the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which please God best. Isn't that great? The prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which God, which please God best. It, it's so easy, right? In this time where, where we haven't been meeting together and, and where we're, we've been sheltered in place to, 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 to become spiritually dry. And, and people, when they're spiritually dry, tend to do a couple of things. They tend to move away from the church they tend to move away from their spiritual disciplines. They stop praying. They stop going into the tower of Scripture. The kind of obedience that waiting upon the Lord calls is, is even when you don't feel like it, even when everything is just your bone dry spiritually, you keep praying, you keep trusting. You see, what we've learned here, right, is that waiting is not sort of what we, I think, tend to think of it is, is that's a passive thing, that we just sit and wait. Now, there's no sitting and waiting here, is there? Waiting is a very active thing. These, you know, we're, we're to um, uh, wait understanding that we're not, we're not, uh, subject to random forces, but that things are coming at us by God's hand at, the, at their appointed time. We wait in the tower of Scripture, getting a Scripture, getting the God's eye view of our life and our, uh, and our reality. We wait uh, with an open mind to being transformed. What is God teaching me here? How is God changing me here through these hard times? We wait by deliberately emphasizing our humility, remembering that um, we're not omniscient, right? And we wait by persevering in our trust. See, there's nothing, there's nothing passive about waiting. It's, it's, a, it's a very active thing. So, so where do you find the power? Where do you find the strength? Where do you find the motivation to do it? To wait on Jesus, especially through the hard times. And Jesus tells us, Jesus gives us some, the power source. Luke chapter 12. Uh, Jesus is describing faith, and, and he describes saving faith as waiting. Listen, he, uh, he says, uh, stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. And then he, then he gives a parable. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. Do 
you hear that? Did you hear the, 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 the shift that Jesus makes? This man's servants are waiting, right? And they're waiting to spring into action, right? Even our English word has that connotation, right? Waiters wait on your table. They're not passive. They're, very, they're, they're working, right? Ladies in waiting serve their mistress. They're not sitting around. They're working hard for their mistress. If you're waiting in ambush, you're, you're, you're not just sitting there. You are, you're working. You're getting ready. You're preparing. So these servants who were waiting for their master to come home to, so that they could spring into action the moment he gets home, uh, Jesus says that's the blessed person. And what that master is going to do is take off his clothes put on servant garb, bring his servants, those, those, those servants who've been waiting on him, bring them to the table, and he's going to wait on them at his table. I can't tell you how absolutely shocking that parable was the moment Jesus spoke that into his culture. There must have been a, just a collective drawing in of breath because this parable breaks every paradigm. It breaks all the norms, right? It is, a master never puts on servants' clothes and he never serves his servants. And yet that's what Jesus is saying that God will do. What kind of God will one day wait on you when he invites you to his table, when he ushers you into his table. What kind of God is that? It's the, it's, the, it's the same kind of God who knelt down and did the dirty work of washing his disciples' feet, a job that none of the disciples would do. And Jesus did that as a, as a mere demonstration of something even greater that he was about to do, right? An, an even greater waiting, an even greater serving, uh, and, and that is that Jesus would go and be sacrificed on a cross for his people. It's the ultimate. It's the ultimate being waited upon. It's the ultimate being served. The Son of God going to de his death so you and I don't have to. Being punished for our sin so that we can know God's grace and God's mercy. You know, you and I can wait on God because we look to the past and we see that Jesus waited on us in a remarkable way. And we look to the future that Jesus refers to here, where he says, one day in the future, in my kingdom, when we're at my table, when we're at my banqueting table, I'm going to wait on you there. It's just, it's mind-blowing, isn't it? To think that, that Jesus Christ, who knows us through and through, loves us that deeply and is going to welcome us that warmly, that, we will, that, we, that he will even wait on us in his kingdom. It's, let that power your waiting. You see, that's a God you can wait on with confidence, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the book of Habakkuk. I thank you for your wonderful promises uh, in Scripture. Um, Lord, help us to wait on you in these hard times. Um, wait humbly. Uh, wait expectantly. Wait with an open mind and an open heart to being changed. Um, thank you. 
that Jesus waited on us by going to the cross. Thank you that Jesus has promised that one day he will wait on us at his dining table. Wow. May that power our faith, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the time in the service, of course, where we would normally have the offering. The offering is, is one of the concrete ways we give expression to uh, our, uh, our faith, right? And, and acknowledge the overwhelming goodness and grace of God to us. Um, thank you for, for giving um, online. Thank you for swinging by the church. Thank you for mailing in your offerings. Uh, your, your generosity is, is just a blessing. And I know that many of you have been financially impacted in a, in a big way here. And uh, um, we want to be here as well to help you. So if you have financial needs or other physical needs, you know, our deacons are standing by. We have funds here. Uh, please let us know. Okay, that's that is one of the ways that we uh, pull together and, and uh, help each other through this uh, through the, these difficult days. Okay, let's uh, let's continue and conclude our worship uh, as uh, as we sing our final song. Today. Faithfulness, O oh God You wrestle with the sinner's heart You lead us by still water and to mercy And nothing can keep us apart so remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Your love and justice, God You use the weak to lead the strong You lead us in the song of your salvation And all your people say along so remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Children, remember your promise, so oh God. Your grace is enough, have it reaching now to us. Your grace is enough for me.
church, I hope you've been encouraged today, especially this lesson to wait on the Lord is hard. But when you realize the goodness of the Lord, especially in Jesus Christ, it's not so hard. But we have another blessing. Every time we meet together for worship, the Lord not only blesses us with his grace through his word and through prayer and through singing, but even in the benediction. You see, the benediction is a good word where God places his own name upon you. So church, receive the blessing, the benediction, the name of Jesus Christ upon you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.